Bushu, Hanin, Tanya Talaga, Nagis Nikas, Ka Musko, Pimoshije, Pinishish Nagis Nikas. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Talaga. I am a First Nations person. I am a member of Fort William First Nation, and I am delighted to be here with you today. I'm going to start this evening with a uh, land acknowledgement. I'm here in my home of Takaranto. This is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit, traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee people. I would also like everyone to take a moment and pause and think of the lands in which they are sitting on, you are sitting on right now. I want you to do a virtual land affirmation, if you will. Miigwech, and thank you for joining us. This is our very third and final fireside chat on Indigenous help. The CMA is hosting this series of discussions to hear from Indigenous patients, providers, healthcare leaders on how to move forward together as part of a commitment to tangible action on reconciliation in healthcare. In our first session, we discussed the importance of cultural safety in healthcare settings for both patients and providers. Our second session focused on the work the CMA is doing to improve the health of Indigenous peoples recognizing that First Nation, Inuit, and Métis continue to experience unacceptable health disparities due to the legacy of colonization and ongoing systemic racism. If you couldn't attend those first two sessions, recordings are available. A link will be in the chat. Today is the final conversation in this series, and the focus is the meaning and the importance of an apology to Indigenous peoples. To kick things off though, I do wanna go over a few housekeeping items. We ask everyone to support a respectful, professional and collaborative discussion. Questions that are discriminatory, defamatory, abusive or offensive, or that violate privacy or confidentiality will not be addressed. And we will start with a moderated Q&A with our speakers, followed by audience Q&A. Questions will be text-based and can be upvoted. So please do that and I will see them and I promise to, um, to be fair and to notice all of the upvoted questions. And now let me introduce our speakers for tonight's session. First off, I am going to start with Dr. Alika Lafontaine. Dr. Lafontaine has been a healthcare leader for more than two decades and is a past president of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada, a board member with Healthcare Can, and from 2013 to 2017, he co-led the Indigenous Health Alliance, which advocated for 68 million in federal funding on behalf of more than 150 First Nations in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. In 2020, Dr. LaFontaine launched Safe Space Networks, a platform for patients and providers to report racism in the healthcare system and contribute to change. McLean's named him the country's top health innovator in their 2023 power list. And he was the very first Indigenous physician listed in the Medical Post's 50 Most Powerful Doctors. Dr. LaFontaine is Métis, Ujikri, and Pacific Islander ancestry. He continues to practice anesthesiology in Grand Prairie, Alberta. And now I'm going to introduce you to President Natan Obed. Natan is the president of Inuit Tapirat Kananatami, serving as a national spokesperson representing Canada's more than 70,000 Inuit. 
He was first elected in 2015 and was acclaimed to his third consecutive term in 2021. As president, he implements the direction set out by Inuit leadership from the four regions of Inuit Nunungat, the Inuvalet settlement region of the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatsivit. He also serves as vice president of Inuit Circumpolar Council of Canada. President Obed grew up in Nain, the northernmost community in Labrador's Nunsivut region. He is a graduate of Tufts University. Welcome, Natan. Thank you, Tanya. And we have President Cassidy Caron as well. She's the very first woman elected as the president of the Métis National Council. With roots in the historic Métis communities of Batoche and St. Louis, Saskatchewan, she grew up closely connected to her tradition, heritage, and culture. From 2016 to 2020, she was elected to the Métis Nation, British Columbia, serving as the organization's youth chair and minister responsible for youth. Ms. Caron has also consulted on both provincially and nationally administered programs supporting Indigenous peoples. Her work incorporates innovative approaches to community development and nation building, which promote effective collaboration and deeper understanding between Indigenous peoples and for all Canadians. Welcome, Cassidy. Pansay, everyone. Thank you. And finally, I would like to introduce Marion Crow. Marion is the CEO of the First Nations Health Managers Association and a proud Cree woman from the Piapot First Nation in Treaty 4 territory, Saskatchewan. In 2010, Marion launched FNHMA, a national family dedicated to honoring, maintaining, and upholding inherent ways of knowing while balancing managing priorities to bring excellence to First Nations communities and to health programs. She was appointed CEO of the organization in 2018 in recognition of her exceptional leadership and dedication to serving nations and communities to support quality and equitable health services across Turtle Island. Marion is a true trailblazer and renowned for her vision, commitment, and passion to uplift, educate, and lay a path for future generations. Marion, thank you for joining us. Now, um, now that we have that all out of the way, and I apologize if I mispronounced uh, anything, um, totally my fault. And I know, um, I know, I didn't attend. And you could, you could yell at me about that later on. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Tonight really is um, a special evening um, for all of us. It is uh, an evening of firsts, and I hope a continued continued um, conversation with Indigenous peoples all across this country. Alika, as the CMA's first Indigenous president. I really want to start by asking you to describe how the CMA has embarked on their journey thus far, a journey of reconciliation under your leadership and those of your colleagues. Thanks so much, Tanya. Um, just, I, I just want to take a moment just to appreciate the weight of this moment. You know, the, the CMA has never had Indigenous political leadership that represent uh, Indigenous peoples as, as part of our, our webinars before and just acknowledge President Obed, uh, President Casty, and, you know, a national advocacy organization that also does training for our health directors across First Nations here in Canada. Uh, it's, it's a moment that I'm, I'm really proud of. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of the CMA for helping to create this space, but even more importantly, I'm, I'm proud of our own Indigenous people for filling that space and uh, really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, for those of you who've been a part of the CMA for the past few years, uh, you may remember 2015 when Ted Cusance, who was a past chief of Kisikus First Nation, came and spoke on the floor of our annual general meeting. And up until that point, there had never actually been a residential school survivor. 
who acknowledged uh, and addressed the uh, gathering of physicians um, at the CMA in its 150 plus year history. And I, I remember sitting beside Ted as he he gave his speech and th there wasn't a dry eye in the room, including me, as he stated, you know, we're, we're here as First Nations, as Indigenous people with our hands outstretched, hoping that you'll reach back. And since that time, you know, at the at the CMA, there's been a lot of work to build on the path to reconciliation. And it's obviously hundreds and hundreds of steps. It requires space to be created. And I, I think today we're taking an important step that acknowledges that trust and relationships are at the core of reconciliation. You know, that is why truth leads to reconciliation. And with that in mind, I, I will acknowledge tonight that the CMA is going to take a vital step in our reconciliation journey towards a formal apology to Indigenous people, rooted in an accurate shared history about what happened and what matters most to Indigenous people. The, the path to an apology will be informed by an honest examination of our 150 plus year history here at the CMA. And I expect it's going to take us to many uncomfortable and painful conversations. But the hope is, is that through this process, the CMA can be a part of reconciling and transforming the relationship that the medical profession has with Indigenous peoples and actually bring us closer to true reconciliation. You know, the, the profession's history is Canada's history. It includes the devastating impacts of Indian hospitals, forced medical experimentation on Indigenous people, disparate investment in infrastructure and health access, as well as systemic racism, neglect, and abuse. It's a past that remains present in the day-to-day -day experiences of Indigenous people across our shared lands. To be meaningful, this apology has to happen over time, building on aggregated moments that we gather together with an end goal of rediscovering each other and our history and rebuilding trust between providers and Indigenous patients, families, and communities. Now, as the first president of Indigenous Ancestry to lead the CMA, I'll tell you that I will stand resolute with this organization to take these steps in a good way. We are committed to an apology as a meaningful step towards reconciliation and walking with Indigenous peoples towards our Indigenous health goal, which is transformed health systems that are free of racism and discrimination, that uphold Indigenous peoples' right to self-determination, that values respect, respects and holds safe space for Indigenous worldviews, medicine, and healing practices, and provides equitable access to culturally safe, trauma-informed care for all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Thanks for the opportunity to share those words, Tanya, and I'll turn it back to you. Um, Miigwech. Um, I know that those are incredibly heartfelt words coming from you, the CMA's very first Indigenous president. And those are um, those are heavy words. They're heavy words. They're heavy words uh, for all of us to hear. And I'm I'm very grateful that you have that you've made them, because uh, as we know, we have um, we have been for the large part as Indigenous people shut out of the healthcare system, and it was not designed for us. The universal healthcare system that everyone speaks of so glowingly all over the world, sadly, was not designed for Indigenous people whatsoever. We have seen that um, time and time again, and it is very important, um, I know I can say this as a First Nations person, um, to hear an apology from, from yourself, and I know it does not come easy, and that this is just a first step as well. It is a first step because there's a lot to discuss and a lot to fix. And for that, I'm going to ask all of our panelists, um, I will go to each of you, um, to reflect on what an apology means. And I'm going to start with the very first person I see, and that is Natan. Well, uh, thanks Thanks for that. And um, Alika, Dr. Lafontaine, I've appreciated being able to speak candidly with you uh, in your role now, but also 
conversations we've had over time. Uh, immediately, um, I think about the scenarios that lead us to an apology and the government policies, systemic racism, um, the lack of humanity, uh, perhaps, that has been attributed to Inuit uh, by the medical profession over the past 175 years in this country that lead us to this point in time. Uh, I also think about the way in which apologies um, can be meaningful and contrast them with um, the way in which apologies come sometimes can be in, seem insincere or miss the target. Because it, um, it's never too late to apologize um, in any scenario where you have done wrong to another group. Uh, and when there are human rights abuses by uh, particular institutions or governments, I think there is always space for those apologies to happen and a new path to be charted. In these times, there are always going to be uh, dissenters, people who don't think this is the right thing to do, either from a risk perspective or from a historic perspective. Uh, I think it's human nature to never feel like you have done wrong individually, or you have perpetuated racism, or you have participated in an institution that has been racist or has uh, undermined human rights of a particular group of people especially when um, you know the medical profession and the oaths that are taken to pursue this this particular line of work are so in contrary um, to those uh, those uh, breaches in uh, conduct. But it's uncomfortable sometimes to hear what has happened. And uh, across Inuit Nunangat, our entire uh, lives are still transformed to this day by, the inequities within the health system and the foundations of the health system across our homeland. Um, in the 1950s, uh, the tuberculosis epidemic was approached not from providing care within our homelands, but um, we were taken from our homelands uh, and put in sanatoriums sometimes for years at a time. Uh, sometimes our patients died, uh, patients were separated between uh, you know, mothers and fathers and, and children. Um, and if anyone died within those scenarios, most likely the next of kin was not notified. Um, we were still trying to find out where some of these people are buried. That is just one example of how medical care to Inuit has um, been a traumatic experience for Inuit and one that is completely outside of um, the norms for uh, the way in which human beings care for one another. I do hope that we can have some of these conversations without pointing the fingers at anyone here at the helm today, but uh, I think this is so important. When we understand what is happening today and we understand the inequities that are still happening today, the idea that, say, in the jurisdiction like Nunavut, which is a territory with 85% Inuit population, there is no obligation for health services to be delivered to patients in Inuktut, especially if they are um, done in a federal way. And that is within a jurisdiction that has a majority population of a, a language that is neither English or French. And yes, uh, you can hide behind government policy and federal government policy, um, but when it comes to um, the expectation of care, the understanding of a patient on what care is happening to them, and the relationship between a doctor and a patient, um, it is quite obvious that the use of the mother tongue or the use of sometimes the only language that that person knows is the only way to respectful care. Once we know these things, what are we going to do? And what are we all going to do together to close these gaps? Um, not only in uh, the way care is provided, 
but also the gaps in outcomes um, for socioeconomic status between Inuit in this case um, and the rest of Canada. So there's lots of work to do, but I really appreciate the openness of the CMA to hold a forum like this and also to have the intention to apologize on such um, a devastating chapter of Canada's history and the role that the medical profession has played within it. Miigwech, hmm. Miigwech, Natan. I'm going to turn uh, to Marion Crow now. Your turn, Marion. Thank you so much. And it was just an honor listening uh, to you speak. And Alika, I'm emotional in hearing that apology and the path to reconciliation action and the journey that the, CM the CMA is on. I have to say this, it's never too late for an apology. And this gives me hope. Hope meaning purpose and belonging are the anchors of how we move forward. This gives me hope that hospitals all across Turtle Island will hear this and ask Indigenous patients to stand with them in creating a zero tolerance, zero tolerance for any kind of abuse, mistreatment or racism that a patient experiences. When we look at this from a quality perspective and from a patient experience perspective, I think about you know, uh, a racist institute, as the former speaker said, when we participate in those actions, I myself am the very first Indigenous person on the Ottawa Hospital Board of Governors. I can tell you by being in these spaces, in these places, people are hearing us, they're listening to us, and don't be a token on these types of boards. You can inform the system and help it be a better experience for the next seven generations that come behind us. And I'm gonna send it back to you, Tanya, because I know you have a great deal of information to get through to our audience tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Miigwech, Marianne, for your heartfelt words as well. Cassidy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Um, your thoughts on the apology? Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you, um, Alika, for having us and uh, for the incredible amount of work that you've done in the, the few months that you've held this position. I think there's been a lot of conversation in this last year, this last year and a half about reconciliation and apologies and what that actually means. And one of the things that you said was, you know, it requires listening and it's clear that you and others at the CMA have listened and now want to move forward on this path in a really good way. And I think having these conversations with Indigenous people is absolutely one of the first places to begin. Um, of course, Métis, Inuit and First Nations people have had to work extremely hard um, over decades to reverse the harm that has been ca caused by colonialism, by denialism, and by systemic attacks on our people within Western and dominating systems, which includes the healthcare system. And for years, this work has been on our shoulders alone. Um, it has taken a significant amount of advocacy, um, patience, and dedication of leaders who have come long before me, um, but it shouldn't have to just rest on our shoulders as Indigenous peoples. Um, there's a role for everybody to be playing within reconciliation, within all of these systems, within all of these sectors, um, big or small, the, the role that you can play is significant. Um, an apology it really acknowledges um, it acknowledges that a harm has been done, and that requires being truthful about the past, and and it requires thinking about the future, where you know Métis and other Indigenous peoples are respected as the peoples of these lands, as the unique peoples with recognized rights under Canada's constitution, and it truly is an apology is a first step. It, it's opening a door to rebuilding trust. Um, if it is done in a good way. 
because trust is just not simply handed out uh, with a few words. It's really earned through a process of, of relationship building and rebuilding. And uh, I think that the process that the CMA is looking to, to roll out is one that is really honorable. And, and I do look forward to, um, to seeing how this goes. So thank you so much. Miigwech, uh, Cassidy, for, for those uh, wise words, as always. Um, and I, I, want to, um, I want to make a special mention at the moment um, for the role that Alika is playing here. Um, I, I think that uh, we should all take a moment to recognize the, um, the strength and the importance of what Alika is doing especially since he is an Indigenous person. Alika is Uja Cree and he is Métis. And he is also a doctor and head of the CMA. By virtue of his blood, of who he is, he is connected to this land. So I want everyone on the CMA to think about that for a moment. You know, um, reconciliation is something that Canadians must do with us. The onus is not on ourselves to be the ones reconciling. Yet here is Alika doing something that is really quite incredible and bringing the institution forward. I just I think it's important that we acknowledge that that fact here today. Um, Alika, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I, I just want to say first off, I I think the burden on my shoulders is a lot lighter than the burden on Natan's, Cassidy's, Marion's, and every other Indigenous leader out there. You know, um, uh, Tanya and I were were having a conversation about dual identity. Uh, not too long back. And, you know, I, I'm often asked in interviews, when was the first time that you witnessed racism in the healthcare system? And I, I remember every moment of that clear as day. I had experienced racism myself prior as a patient, but it was the first time that I was on the other side of the curtain. I was a medical student and I watched two men come in in a, a short period of time of each other. And one of them was clearly Indigenous, could have been Métis, could have been First Nation and had similar presenting symptoms, slurred speech on city gate. They, they were having trouble standing up and a, a change in their level of consciousness. And one of the men was moved over to a bed and had a full workup that I was a part of. We tested for a variety of different things that it could have been. It included things like alcoholism, but it was also we checked for stroke and heart attack and all these other things. And the other man was taken over to a room. The light was dimmed. He was given a sandwich and a blanket. And everyone said, we'll just let him sleep it off. And in that moment, um, I think there was something that kind of turned in me where I realized that I had signed on to be part of a system that, you know, often creates a lot of harm for my family and the family and friends that, I've grown to love across this land. And I, I think for Indigenous physicians, you know, Indigenous teachers, Indigenous social workers, you know, anyone who are in these systems where, you know, this this, this un, unreasonable treatment happens to Inuit, Métis, and, and First Nation people, we we struggle because we're both part of the system that creates this harm but we're also part of the people who experienced that harm. And I, I think that, that that puts sometimes a, an unfair burden on a lot of us, but until we reach the point of reconciliation, it's, it's a necessary burden. You know, I, I remember shortly after um, being inaugurated as president uh, last summer, my mom gave me a hug and she said, you know, if it wasn't you, it would have been someone else to be the first Indigenous president, but treat this year like it should have been you. And I, I've tried to move forward with every step over this past year with the idea that I could make a difference. You know, not because I'm, I'm unique or special, you know, but because I'm here. And I, I think when I, I listen to Natan and, and Cassidy and, and Marion talk, 
I, I think to myself, thank goodness they're there standing where they are and lifting where they are. And I, I just say to all of my Indigenous colleagues who work in the medical profession, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, other, other colleagues, you know, we have a real opportunity in today and then moving forward to really make a difference for our people, for ourselves, and, you know, to, to really use that dual identity to push things forward. And we have to carry that burden because if not, who's going to? So well said, so well said. You know, we've heard this is the last year, this has been, um, there's been a lot of apologies. Um, I'm thinking of the, uh, the Pope's apology uh, last summer and uh, the importance of apologies. So how do you begin to build trust? An apology has happened. How does trust happen for Indigenous people once they've heard this word or the words, I'm sorry? Natan? In many ways, uh, you know, I, I just think of my friends and family, myself, and what that means. I mean, if you ever go to an Inuit community, um, so a lot of people are going to welcome you. People are going to ask you where you're from. People are going to ask you if you're rich. People are going to ask you if you're married, if you have kids. And this is just the, like the 8 to 12-year-olds on the street. Other people will, you know, offer you a meal, will make sure that you have whatever you need during your time. If it's in the winter, perhaps people will be um, saying you need you need better mitts. We are, to a fault, very welcoming. And I think when we go into medical care facilities and we have interactions with doctors, uh, there is a there's another history that's side by side with our openness and willingness to uh, bring people in and welcome people into our communities versus the way that we've been treated over the past 70 or so years, especially within healthcare delivery. And that is that we are subhuman, that really don't matter, and that we're um, in many cases, administrative footballs. Um, in our communities, there are health centers with nurses um, largely our systems are to refer people into major Canadian centers. Uh, governments have service agreements with, um, with provinces and territories. And so most of the care happens in, uh, with people who know nothing about the lived reality or um, even the geographic place on a map where this person is coming from. And often it is thousands of kilometers away for this person sitting in one of the most uh, difficult times in their life, being serviced by somebody who is not part of their community and can't speak their language and has vastly different cultural norms about communication. So what I, what I hope that for the system is for the, those types of things to be recognized and incorporated into care and for people to be humans first and to care for fellow humans, rather than uh, in many cases uh, where either it is a frustration with the the burden to care at all for for these patients because they're not part of the system, uh, the local system, or then the considerations in many cases for payment, uh, which often are negotiated between um, the federal government. Uh, and interjurisdictional uh, issues. And it is going back to Jordan's principle. Uh, it is provide the care that a person needs and figure everything else out um, somewhere else. And think of them as your neighbors and people that you have to have empathy for. Um, I think it's a huge challenge for, for the medical establishment to do that. I think, um, as Alika mentioned, there is systemic racism and cultural prejudice. And there's also this understand, this sometimes this baked in um, belief that somehow Inuit cannot understand 
um, what is being uh, told in, in these encounters. But ultimately, we're not stupid. Uh, we just are coming from a very different pl place and, and speak a very different language. And if medical doctors had to come into our communities and speak our language to deliver care, it certainly would uh, be a very different reality. And I think there would be a greater appreciation for what we go through when we go to places like Ottawa and Winnipeg and Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Extremely well said, Natan, as always. Marion, as well, um, now that you've heard an apology and apologies on the offering, how do you build trust? Well, I think trust is a thousand cups of tea. It's getting to know the patient population in which you're serving. And I think right away about not just an apology, but the hope of reconciling action as somebody who gets to lead an amazing organization of health directors in my role at the hospital, I start going into operations mode. And what does that mean? How do we become allies in getting rid of racism? How do we acknowledge the territories that we are on? And I don't mean performatively like a check mark. I'm talking about how do we put into the system spaces that reflect us, that create space for us to practice ceremony. Someday I picture a hospital that has signed on to rise above racism like the CMA. I'm putting a plug in there for folks who are looking for a roadmap. If you go to the riseaboveracism.ca website, you'll find an amazing campaign on eliminating racism in the healthcare system. You'll be able to see the reconcile action journey that the CMA is on, that the Ottawa Hospital is on, and many other pan-Canadian health organizations. I hope that one day I can walk into a hospital and I am prioritized in emergency, just like I was during COVID. I know I'm dreaming, but I think we're getting closer to seeing us prescribe traditional medicines in the hospital from an Indigenous physician. Those are my dreams, and it's possible. We see this happening in Toronto by the amazing work of Dr. Lisa Richardson. So again, I know that this is such a heavy and traumatizing conversation, but let's talk about the steps in how we eliminate racism in healthcare. Thank you for the question, Tanya. Thank you, Marian, and I, uh, I applaud the work you're doing, um, Rise Above Racism. Please Google search it, check it out on Marian's website, okay? Um, and I know that, um, you know, every little bit helps. Um, so I, I urge you to check out Rise Above Racism. Now, Cassidy, uh, you've heard the apology, the beginnings of an apology, how do you build trust? Um, I think what we've learned and what we've heard over and over again in these last number of years when talking about apologies is that, of course, it has to be followed with action um, and action that is actually creating real systemic change. Um, I, I have an, an elder who, who has told me time and time again that we have a closet full of stories, um, but not enough action to follow those stories. Um, and that we don't have a word in our language for reconciliation, but the, the word that closely translates to reconciliation um, actually means setting things right. And, and that's what's needed right now. We need to set things right because for Métis communities, um, similar to Inuit and First Nations, we've long faced significant barriers in accessing this quality health care that is free of discrimination um, and it's resulted in severe health disparities for our people. Um, so moving forward there has to be a significant amount of action to change that system. Um, that takes a lot of work. It's it's ingrained in a system. Um, so the healthcare system has to commit to 
providing and 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 do, actually doing it uh, uh, providing culturally safe and accessible care to to our people um as natan was saying it, it requires recognizing and respecting um, our unique worldviews our traditions our healing practices and ensuring that healthcare services are also geographically and financially accessible um recognizing the social determinants of health for our people or in our case you know we've done a lot of work to understand what the metis um the determinants of health for metis communities are and really applying that and taking those into consideration so that we can make sure that health care actually um, addresses the unique needs of our people and so a lot of this is going to require um, cultural competency training for healthcare professionals. It's going to require the recruitment and retention of Métis healthcare workers for, for Métis, speaking Métis specific here. Um, the integration, like I say, of traditional Métis healing practices into these mainstream um, systems and finding a way to actually make it work and not just, you know, putting, putting an infinity sign on it doesn't make it culturally relevant. Um, it also means including Métis voices and perspectives in decision-making processes that shape the healthcare policies and practices, just like what Alika is doing right now, holding these leadership positions, not just the on-the-ground positions, but the ones that are making decisions. Um, there's so much that can be done. There's so much work that um, our institutions have done to understand what the unique needs of our people are, the Métis National Council, um, ITK, AFN, all of those institutions, we know what our people need. We've done the research. Um, and now, you know, it's, it's looking for equal partners to actually roll this work out and create the systems change that's needed to take care of our people the way that they deserve. Amazing. Uh, thank you very much for those, uh, for your words, Cassidy. Um, and I encourage everyone to uh, put their questions um, in the chat. Uh, we'd love to uh, we'd um, we'd love to listen to what you have to say. Um, and please submit your questions uh, for the speakers through the Q and A button, and you can upvote questions as well. Um, and uh, I have a, a couple of questions in there. As soon as we put the call out, they came. Um, but, uh, Alika, um, I'm going to uh, switch to questions, but I, I, is it possible to quickly answer the question that I posed to everyone else in how, how do you build trust now? Yeah, I, I think trust starts with relationships, right? And I, I know one of the things that was really important to myself and, and other folks in the CMA who've been pushing through for this work, the guiding circle, you know, Indigenous staff, our, our senior uh, executive and, and our CEO was, you know, making sure that we engaged in proper ways. You know, this year we engaged with the AFN, ITK and MNC all through proper protocol. You know, uh, before this conversation, we, we actually sat down and we talked about uh, what was important. And I, I think that at the beginning, we actually will lean pretty heavily on Indigenous folks inside the healthcare system, you know, advocacy organizations like Marion's and our political organizations, like the, the organizations that President Karan and President Obed lead in helping us to understand how to develop that trust. And, and I think folks on the ground, you know, patients, families, and communities who, you know, see the movement of people that they trust, trusting the CMA is a big part of starting that, that journey. And I, I think our job at the CMA is not to let them down. Just like uh, Casty was saying, we, we have to make sure that we follow through with these conversations with action and that we make a difference in the lives of, of patients. You know, I, I know when I was speaking with, with uh, President Obed and when we were having our, our first meeting, we talked about how, you know, everywhere else in Canada, there's that expectation that you'll be introduced by your name, that, you know, there'll be a bit of your conversation, at least in the language that, that you speak fluently. But uh, that's not true for any of people. You know, sometimes providers don't even attempt to pronunciate uh, Inuit names. And I, I don't understand how you can train and understand, you know, a complex procedure mm -hmm. like a Fontan, but you can't spend, you know, three minutes to try and learn uh, how to properly pronounce someone else's name. And I, I think that a lot of what we do in medicine, we get used to doing it that way. I don't think it's necessarily rooted in, you know, trying to create harm. 
but I think we have all these norms where, you know, we focus on one area and try our hardest. And then when we try and humanize each other, we, we fall short. And I, I think this process gives us an opportunity to line those up better. And I think it will not only be better for patients, it'll be better for us as clinicians as well. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful that in every encounter that you have with an Indigenous person, you feel the trust, you feel the closeness, and, you know, you can move forward in helping them kind of with their path through the healthcare system so they can return back home. Miigwech. Um I'm moving on uh, to the Q&A now with our participants. And uh, I've got a really good question here from um, Dr. Emmett Francoeur. The doctor asks, for many physicians across Canada who are choosing to be committed to this kind of reconciliation, the frustration is that we do not come in contact with many or any First Nations people. How do we make a difference? So that's an interesting question. And I am going to turn that over to hmm, Marion first. I knew you were going to pick me. I'm not <laughs> sure why I knew that, but... Oh, well, I would, I would definitely say, I'm pretty sure you do come into contact with First Nations, Inuit or Métis people, and you don't know. Mm -hmm. So here's one small step, and it's an easy one. Read Indigenous, buy Indigenous, shop Indigenous, but really is about being an ally and an advocate. For, I hate the word underserved and marginalized for a whole host of reasons, but we need allies in this space. We need you to be informed about our Indigenous ways of knowing, of ceremonies that we might be practicing. We need the compassion of allies like yourself. So I would just encourage you to start opening the books we have an author who has an amazing book um, right here. I would start with that one. Miigwech, thank you. Appreciate uh, all plugs for my books. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, new one coming out shortly. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to ask this question as as well to um, to Cassidy, actually. Um, I do, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough one, um, but, it's interesting, right? I mean, it's interesting too that physicians think that they're not coming across Indigenous people when in actual fact, they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing as Marion. Um, it's very likely that you you have come across an Indigenous person in, in the work that you do. Um, for Métis people specifically, you know, we're not phenotypic, phenotypically distinct. We don't all look the same. You can't just um, look at a person walking in a room and say, oh, that's a Métis person. Um, so unless that person self-identifies, you wouldn't know. And a lot of Métis people don't self-identify within the healthcare system because they know the horror stories of Indigenous people and how they are treated within the healthcare system. So if somebody is um able to walk into a doctor's office and um not automatically uh, look like what people think an indigenous person looks like they may not choose to self identify because they think that they will get better healthcare service and it's likely that they will um so part of that is again just um you know being aware of that is is an extremely important uh, factor um, just treating everybody with, with humanity, um, is, is the other thing. If somebody is, feels like they're being treated in a very good way, they're, they're going to open up a little bit more. Um, and if they have a good experience, you know, that goes a long way. So it's just treating everybody with absolute humanity and, and decency. Um, the other thing I guess is, is if it is in fact that you haven't ever come across an Indigenous person within your practice, um, and, and you are looking for something to do, um, to, to contribute to this conversation, um, you know, 
read up on on the work that we are doing um, for for us the Métis National Council specifically read up on on the research that we're doing um, that shows data on how Métis people are not getting the healthcare um, services that that they need and the the work that we're doing to advocate at the federal level, at the provincial level, to make sure that that changes so that you can be aware in your own way um, and, and be an advocate uh, just, just from the work that you're doing. So there's a lot that you can do. Um, just uh, raising raising your awareness is, is step one, I think. Mm. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I want to get to this one, and I'm recognizing that we've got nine minutes left, um, but it's a uh, good one um it's, it's kind of loaded too here is there any examples of physicians being held accountable by their organizations or institutions or regulatory bodies by for racism causing harm this one doctor said that my experience is that they are protected on every front as a profession and recently um the doctor was in a meeting with indigenous leadership um and the leadership of the hospital said that if any physician causing causing harm through racism will be fired. Um, but this doctor said that they have yet to see a real example, despite many complaints coming through the patient experience or in social media. Now, I'm unclear as to whether or not that means many, this doctor has not seen many examples of racism um, or how doctors are held accountable. Um, I'm going to turn it to Alika first, and then I'm going to ask Natan of um, any examples he might have heard of of physicians being held accountable. Yeah, I think this is a really valuable question and one that I really hope that we we dig into and unpack over the coming months as we go through this apology process. Um, the reality is, is that you don't see what you don't measure. And if you don't see something, you never solve it. And I, I think that it's very clear that racism has existed across Canada, but we're unsure where it's a big enough problem that we have to do something about it. You know, and I, I think in, in medicine, we're very good at reframing situations to kind of mitigate responsibility. When a person has a hostile experience and they choose not to pursue further medical care because they don't trust the folks that are providing that care and that leads to harm you know whose fault is that in medicine you know and i i think that 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 aspect of of the the experience of racism in the healthcare system can be underestimated there, there are many folks across the country who are inuit metis and first nation who delay presentation to care until they have no other choice because they're afraid or because they've had previous bad experiences or they're worried that they will actually have something worse happen to them as a result of stories that they've heard or stories that they've experienced personally. And I, I don't think that in general, our, our way of dealing with patient concerns and complaints has done a great job at addressing racism, not only Indigenous specific, but also racism felt by many other uh, persons of color across, across Canada. Um, that means that we have an enormous opportunity to hear these stories and, and change the way that we look at these experiences. And I, I think the, the final thing that I'll say is that it's important to recognize that in many places where people experience in these harms, there's not a lot of physicians who go there. So just to the previous uh, question, if you don't see a lot of Indigenous people in your practice, go to places where there's Indigenous people. You know, sign up to do a locum in Nunavut. Sign up to do a locum in, in the Métis settlements here in Northern Alberta, where I live and work. You know, go to an underserviced community. They need your skills so they can have access to these things. Don't just read about things. Go and meet the people. <laughs> you know, that's the most important part of reconciliation. Honestly, it's the it's the most wonderful part of reconciliation is, you know, we, we understand and create accuracy in, in our history and we create new memories moving forward that, you know, are, are things that we can be proud of and that bring us joy and happiness. Miigwech for that. Um, I'd like, uh, I, you know, for Natan to spend a couple of minutes as well, uh, quickly, if you can, quickly as well. Um, talk about, have you seen uh, physicians being held accountable? And should they visit 
new to it? Oh. Well, uh, physicians are a self-regulated profession, uh, unlike many other um, professions. It doesn't mean they're not above uh, the law and legislation that governs the practice and also um, you know, uh, uh, cr criminality within the practice. I'm not aware of any physician that has been held to account for simply being racist. Um, but And then immediately we're still back in the place where I immediately then think of, okay, for forced sterilization um, or for um, misdiagnosis or for um, a lack of interest in pursuing medical care. The self-regulatory part of of the medical community and the ability for uh, the accountability from within, I hope will be a foundation of this reconciliation movement within the medical community. I also hope that there would be more accountability uh, within um, uh, the system to identify incident incidences of racism and then to properly address them. I don't think that we're there yet either. And as far as um, uh, medical uh, professionals coming to Inuit Nunangat, there are very few communities where you can actually practice, but there is a, a, a huge need and they're usually general practitioners. There are a few doctors that, that are resident doctors that stay uh, their whole careers in places like Akaluit or places like Kujwak, but uh, if a part of your career overlaps with, or if you are at a particular expertise um, that you can provide service to a particular portion of Inuit Nunagat, uh, please um, find a way to make that happen. <laughs> Miigwech. I know that was a difficult uh, curveball of a question there, Natan. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm going to make a plea here for access uh, for the CMA to continue their work in trying to access our underserviced communities, um, as you've heard uh, from all three uh, of of our, our peoples here tonight. Um, I'm going to make a plea as well for Northern Ontario. We hardly have any doctors whatsoever. In fact, I barely any in a lot of our communities. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. And I want to give everyone a minute to say a uh, closing response. And I know that's tough, it's a minute. Uh, but, uh, um, I'm going to uh, to start with you, Cassidy, and then I'm going to go around my little circle and end with Alika. Sure, I guess I'll just close just by saying thank you again um, to the CMA and to uh, to Alika for for hosting this and and Tanya as well for guiding this conversation. Um, a, a big part of reconciliation is just ensuring that the conversation continues, that we don't stop uh, talking about the injustices that Indigenous people face in this country and, and the solutions that we can apply. Um, it takes, again, like I said, it takes dedication, it takes patience, it, it does take time, it will be frustrating, um, but I do hold a lot of hope that we can change systems from within um, to better serve uh, our people within this country. So um, I'm thankful for the time that we have to discuss this today, and, and I look forward to continuing to work with you with your last few months, Alika, and then again into the future as well. So thank you so much. Miigwech. Marianne. If you see something, say something. It, remember all of the ads in the airports all over the place? Please, I know it's a really hard experience to report racism, but please find a patient navigator, find the Indigenous person in the hospital and put forward the complaint. I have witnessed where somebody has been fired. Security guards have been fired from a hospital for their actions and their response and racism. And if you're a hospital administrator, deploy safe spaces. Miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech. Natan. Well, I look forward to the future conversations with the CMA, with you, Alika. 
on making good on this um, uh, pledge to apologize. Uh, perhaps the one thing that I'd say, a piece of advice, is to try your best, all of you who provide care, to work in an anti-racist way. And that means um, be very careful about how you word questions, uh, your unconscious bias, um, some of the things that you might want to say or ask. Let the patient lead in those cultural conversations. Uh, they expect you to lead in the medical conversation. Uh, but don't think because you read a book or you watched a movie about our communities that then you can then that you have the license to be able to then just cast your judgment or filter and expect the patient to reflect what you think you know. Just simply learn. Uh, and if you, it took you seven or eight years to get a medical degree, just imagine how long it will take for you to truly understand our language and culture and have that respect for it, and you'll do really well. Mm, like which, Alika? Yeah, the the only piece that that I'll say, and I, I'm so grateful for the wisdom that Natan, Cassie, and, and Marion, and, and you, Tanya, have shared tonight. Don't get too focused on tomorrow when we have stuff we can do today. You know, it, it's true that we need more investment, that government needs to create programs, that we have a system that just is not designed to provide great care to Indigenous people and really supports a lot of the bias and racism that we see. But don't forget, we do workarounds every day as providers in the healthcare system. We, we keep things stuck together. And if we turn our attention to doing the same thing for Indigenous people, we can make a difference right now in the care that they receive while we try and work towards that, that better tomorrow. Miigwech. I'd like to thank all of the panelists, Alika, Natan, Marion, Cassidy. You are all incredibly wonderful. You're all leaders, and the work you do is so important. I urge you to keep going. I know it's hard, but don't stop. Um, these fireside chats have helped inform the path forward, and together the CMA is committed to continuing the reconciliation journey. Now, if you would like to participate in any further future conversations, the CMA would like you to attend its upcoming health summit in August, both in Ottawa and online. Uh, a, leak, a link, sorry, for more details will be in this chat. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and I apologize for keeping you three minutes over time, but this is one of those conversations that we could have for an incredibly long period of time. There is much work to be done, but I'm confident that working together, it is going to happen for the betterment of all of Canada. So with that, I'd like to say good night, and uh, I was delighted to host you through this webinar. <laughs>